For years and years, I have been telling the world how much Linux sucks. Because I thought, hey, I work in Linux, I use Linux every day, I've made some Linux software and worked at some Linux companies and worked on some Linux projects. I know Linux, I'm, I'm somewhat qualified to speak on the topic. And continually, as I've traveled one convention after another, people have asked me to do a Mac sucks. When are you going to go and give Mac the business? When are you going to make fun of Macintoshes for an hour? And I've always thought, who am I, a Linux user, to go out and tell everyone how much Mac sucks? You know what? Maybe I'll do it one day. Maybe one day I'll sit down and really give it the business and say how much Mac sucks sucks. Then it dawned on me, I may actually be one of the most qualified people on planet Earth to talk about why Macs suck. Uh, let me just talk for a brief moment about my qualifications here. It turns out I've been working on Mac software for the better part of a quarter of a century. <laughs> I may not do it currently, but I worked on versions of Macintosh software for Windows Media Player, multiple versions of Microsoft Office, games for Edmark, IBM. Yeah, I made Mac software for IBM. I worked at multiple startups producing games, utilities, photo and video editing software for Macintoshes. I ran my own Mac software company. There was a period of time. This is not, this is totally a real thing. There was a period of time when you would go into a Mac store, and this was, in some cases, before Apple had Apple stores. I don't know if a lot of you youngins remember this period of time, but there would be stores dedicated to Mac hardware and software, and you'd go in there, and 20% uh, uh, of the boxes that were sitting on the store shelves, I worked on in one way or another. I worked on software for Mac OS 8, Mac OS 9, and Mac OS X during the development of Mac OS X. I got into yelling and screaming matches <laughs> representing companies like Microsoft and many others with Apple engineers about problems with the design of Mac OS X, issues with their APIs, problems galore. So it turns out, other than the people who developed the original Macintoshes and built the Mac OS itself, I may be one of the most qualified people on planet Earth, nay, in the entire universe, to tell you exactly why the Mac sucks so much. And it really, really does. And I want to make this very clear here. The Macintosh has always, always been really easy to make fun of. It has been so easy to make fun of. There have been comic strips and jokes. People ridiculed the Mac, and in some cases, deservedly so, for so many reasons since the Mac existed. I mean, you can't throw a rock on the internet without hitting a handful of memes. I hate that word. Comics, funny, let's call them funny pictures with words on them about how dumb Macs are. Problems with playing games on a Mac, weird design issues. I'm the, seriously, that cheese grater Mac is ridiculous. Remember the Jet Engine Mac, the Macintosh Power Mac G5? When that baby got going, the fans had to kick in and it literally sounded like a jet engine was taking off in your office. It was awesome. <laughs> if by awesome, you mean deafening. And the price of a Mac, it's, it's hugely expensive. Let's, let's go over quickly the five key areas that people have made fun of Macs for. That have, their criticisms have been leveled against the Macintoshes since day one. That they are expensive, exceedingly expensive. That, that you almost have to, have to be a millionaire to go out and use a Macintosh as opposed to other computing platforms. That there was no real multitasking to speak of. That there was, I mean, there was multitasking, but it wasn't real multitasking, you know what I'm saying? That there was no command line. I mean, how can you have a professional computer without a command line? It certainly wasn't very Unix-like. There, there was almost no games, and those Mac zealots, oh my heavens, oh my heavens, were they annoying. They would harp on you about the superiority of the Macintosh until your head exploded. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, and they were annoying as all get out. And they still are to this day. 
Now, but let's let's really think about that. This right here is MPW. Now, many of you may not know what the, the Macintosh Programmer's Workbench is, but back in the days before Mac OS X, back when everyone used to criticize the Mac for not having a command line, for not having Unix underpinnings and all the other things, it actually did. If you installed something called MPW, which was freely available from Apple, you had a Unix-like environment with a full version of the C shell highly optimized and tweaked with stuff added to it so that you could work with Macintosh files and resources and all sorts of things. You, you, you actually had a, a pretty powerful Unix-like working environment with a large amount of Unix tools ported to it and you could make your own on top of that. You had that for the Macintosh. Many people don't realize that was even there, but it was. And even in the earliest days of the Mac, Back in 1987, the Macintosh had multitasking. The very first Macs did not. When the first Mac shipped, there was no multitasking. Well, there kind of, sort of was. You could have these weird little itty-bitty things like calculators and notepads and whatnot that would run as the equivalent of TSRs of terminate and stay resident little drivers that were technically multitasking, but you couldn't run two applications at the same time. And that was, that was infuriating. And then they created MultiFinder, which really, really Finder was like the Windows Explorer, the shell of the Macintosh. And MultiFinder allowed you to run multiple applications at a time in Finder. This is, this is exactly what it looked like in 1987 uh, when, it, when it first shipped. I believe this was Mac OS 5.2. Sorry. It was not called Mac OS back then. It was the Macintosh System Software version 5.2. You'll notice the version numbers on that don't add up. It is Finder version 6.0 or MultiFinder 6.0 with the system software being 4.2. And the overall package, <laughs> I believe, is known as 5.1. <laughs> <laughs> Macintosh system software. Anyway, multitasking did exist then. You had co It was cooperative. It wasn't preemptive, which meant a singular naughty application took the whole gosh darn thing down, which remained one of the most make fun of elements of a Macintosh until fairly recently. It, it, it was truly a hideous thing. But overall... Most Macintosh applications did behave pretty well and tended to not take this, this whole system down all that often. So really, really, if we're being honest here, let's, let's strike out the multitasking and the command line thing. Because those weren't, they weren't real legitimate criticisms. Certainly not for the time. The fact that we had good, cooperative, solid multitasking in the late 1980s on a Macintosh meant that it was kind of on par in a lot of ways with what was happening on the Windows side of things and many other platforms to boot. It wasn't bad. And we had a command line. So, so we were doing pretty, pretty okay. And also, let's strike off the expensive thing. Let, let's, we're not going to make fun of the expensive thing here today. Because the reality is, just because something is expensive doesn't mean it's not awesome. Is a Lamborghini or a Ferrari expensive? Yes. Am I going to buy one? No. <laughs> is it awesome? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. A totally righteously awesome Ferrari is an awesome thing. I'm not going to buy one. I might criticize the price point because I want one and I can't afford one. <laughs> but that doesn't make it suck, right? It just means it's expensive. The same goes for the games thing. Uh, we're going to strike the games thing off of there because any Mac user knew that there were some pretty fantastic games for the Mac platform. And just because a platform doesn't have some of the games available on another platform doesn't mean it's not a fun platform for playing games. The Amiga, as an example, missed out on a huge mountain of games available for DOS and for Windows. There was way more. I mean, some great, great games available for DOS and Windows that never, in any form, sometimes not even whole genres, would come over to the Amiga. Did that make the Amiga a bad gaming platform? No. It was an awesome gaming platform. And the Mac was just the same. There was a wide variety of games available for Macintosh, in some cases only for Macintosh, 
that were pretty fantastic. It was not Windows. It did not have the bazillion game software library. There's no doubt about that. But that didn't make it a bad gaming platform. So we're not going to make fun of that one here either. Now, the Mac Zealots thing, that's a real thing. Uh, any of you who had to deal with Mac Zealots throughout the 80s, especially the late 90s, oh my gosh, were they insufferable in the late 90s. You knew how annoying they could be. They were just annoying. But they did not make the platform sucky. <laughs> they were just really, really annoying. The reality is this. The classic Macintosh... The old Macintosh, the Macintosh before the modern era, up through Mac OS 9, it was flawed. It was fundamentally broken in so many ways. It was bizarre, it was weird, with strange decisions made throughout it. But it was amazing. It was awesome. It was unique, one of a kind, and a gem, a diamond in the rough. It was worth preserving, it was worth marveling at, and it was worth enjoying. The new Macintosh, however, it sucks. It sucks a lot. It sucks so much that I'm going to have a very difficult time making it through the remainder of this show not using naughty words describing how bad it is and how much it sucks. Now, many of you are going to listen to what is about to be flooded upon you, and you're going to disagree with me. You're going to be like, no, Lunduke, no, the Macintosh is awesome. Here's all the things I love about the Macintosh. Zip it. Go back to the slide without all my qualifications. <laughs> and if you do not have those qualifications, zip it. <laughs> I'm just saying flat out. The Macintosh in the old days was awesome. And nowadays, it is not. The old Mac was unique. It took risks. It was weirdly flexible. We're going to go into this. It was so oddly flexible that, shoot, did it give Unix systems a run for their money? Heck yeah, it did. And then some. And people didn't even realize the flexibility and the power of it all. And it was just a plain bizarre system. But it was so, so beautiful and amazing. The Mac was awesome. It was awesome objectively, subjectively, and all the other objectivelys you can throw in there. It was awesome. The current Mac OS, the one with the little underscore, or not the underscore, the a lowercase, the lowercase M with the two words shoved together, the modern Mac, it sucks at being the Mac OS. It is, it is probably the least Mac-like thing I can imagine. Almost every Mac, every, every system out there, you know what? Windows is more Mac-like than current Mac OS. I said it. I said it. I flat out said it. it, it it's just the truth. In fact, the, the most sucky thing about the current Macintosh today is that that suckiness is something that they've done by choice. They didn't make mistakes. They didn't accidentally make a buggy system. They set out to create something that was so uniquely unmac like that they threw their years and decades of design, of legacy, of, of humanity into the garbage. That's terribly sucky. I don't know if this is true or not, but it feels like Apple simply forgot what made the Mac awesome. It's like they, they woke up one morning and they didn't, they didn't know who they were anymore. Maybe it's that all the people that knew what made the Mac awesome are gone. Maybe it's that they've changed their mind. Maybe they made something great and they're like, you know what? We don't want to make that great thing anymore. We want to make something entirely new, which I get. I understand. You don't, you don't wake up every day and do the same job for 40 years without thinking at least occasionally, hmm, Maybe I should try something new. I've always had Wheaties in the morning. Maybe tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and have Cocoa Krispies. I get it. Sometimes you want to do a change. Sometimes you just forget. But I think that the people currently running Apple, the people from the top management on down, simply don't remember what made the Mac great. And it was not that they pushed the cutting edge. It was not that they made something whiz-bangy. 
That was never it. Because if you went back and you looked at the Macintosh, the very first Macintosh, at the same time as the Mac was happening, there was far more whiz-bangy, pretty flashy things happening than what was, than what was released with the first Mac. And that same, that same thing holds true all throughout the 80s and 90s. What made the Mac great is, is almost hard to describe, but I'm going to attempt to show you. I'm going to walk you through the things that really made the Mac great. Because in order to understand why the current Mac sucks so much at being a Mac, you have to first walk through what made it great. What was awesome about it? And it all goes back to this. This is the first Macintosh. This is the 128K Mac. 128K RAM. They did a lot with 128K RAM back then. <laughs> Doggy did they do a lot. Look at that. Look at that bad boy. It's beautiful. Now, this was before a lot of the Mac standards were in place. There was, no, uh, there was no ADB, the Apple desktop bus on here. There was no SCSI port. There, there was a lot of things left to do still. And the, the ROM and the, the floppy drive was a little 400, and K, 400 KB floppy drive. It didn't work with hardly anything. It was a pain in the butt in a lot of ways. But it was beautiful. It was unique and it was interesting. If, you've ever, if you ever go back and watch a video of that initial unveiling of the first Macintosh, it was kind of something special. But let's walk through, let, let's, let's jump past the first, and let's simply walk through some of the things that were great about the Macintosh from that point onward. Let, let, let's, let's take a look at them in no, in no particular order. To start with, in the Macintosh portables, in the classic days, hot swappable batteries. And if batteries weren't hot swappable, they were certainly easy to interchange. This picture here is, is from what was known as the Wall Street PowerBook G3. It was a 233 megahertz power PC based Macintosh laptop. It was fantastic. You see how that person there is pulling a little lever on the front? It causes a, a drive to eject. These were hot swappable drive bays that could contain CD-ROMs, CD burners, DVD-ROM drives, floppy drives, zip drives, and batteries. And there was one on each side. And you could hot swap batteries to your heart's content. Two batteries at once or no batteries at all. It's up to you. Apple even sold a battery charger, a little tiny charging bay that held four batteries at once that you could plop down and you could just swap in and out batteries all day long. There were other laptops that, that, that came out over the years where you'd use a, a quarter to turn a knob and it would plop the whole battery out and it was easy to buy replacement batteries. Super easy to buy replacement batteries. You could have a whole stack of batteries that you could travel with. In fact, battery life for those machines was phenomenal. You slap in two batteries on that laptop right there and you get nine plus ten hours of battery life out of it, no problem. It was pretty fantastic, especially for the day. I mean, the, the PCs could not keep up with it, and it was hot swappable. It was amazing. In fact, the hot swappable and easy access nature of it didn't stop there. Throughout the majority of the Mac lifespan, it was incredibly easy to get to just about any piece and component you could wish for. On the laptops, in fact, they tended to have this, this thing in, in the top corner of them, these little notches. You pull down these little notches. This is from, uh, from an iFixit guide, by the way. These little, where the red circles are, you pull these little notches, and the whole keyboard, boink, it pops up. <laughs> so you can, and you can unplug and re replace your keyboard. So if your keyboard's broken, you just buy a new keyboard and replace it. Well, what's underneath that keyboard? Well, you got your RAM. You got a, you got your Wi-Fi card. In fact, this one from here is, is, is these those little clamshell toilet seat iBooks. They were just adorable little rubberized laptops with a handle. They were, they were ridiculous, but I kind of love them. The keyboards were a little squishy, honestly, but otherwise they were just kind of adorable. They didn't ship with any sort of wireless networking, but they had a PC MCIA card slot underneath the keyboard with a little antenna notch and you could buy the first airport cards which was just a a, a wi-fi an 802.11 uh, uh a and b card i believe and you just stick them in there connect the antenna which would connect it to the antenna throughout the whole of the case and boom you've got you got wi-fi 
all upgradable. You could also get to the hard drive. It, it You needed a few screws. They were pretty easy to do, but a few screws were required to get to the hard drive. This was not unusual. In fact, this was one of the lesser upgradable machines. Yeah. Imagine that nowadays. Compare that to nowadays with any hardware maker. <laughs> right? Right. A, an Apple laptop? They're all glued shut. <laughs> It's ridiculous. But the in the old days, hot swappable batteries, pop off the keyboards, upgrade all the pieces and components. You have ports galore. It was amazing. This is the Mac Plus. Now, why am I showing you the Mac Plus? Just in general. Well, the Mac Plus, it came out in January of 1986. Okay? And it was for sale until the end of October of 1990. I mean, it was for sale, that exact model, for almost five years, just shy of five years. One model. It was amazing. Now, you might say, well, didn't, didn't new models come out that were more powerful at that time? Yes. But this core model was available to schools, education, offices, businesses, and just average everyday users. The price over time came down and more people could afford to get a Mac Plus and the whole industry sort of standardized around a Mac Plus. Software developers could standardize on it. And it wasn't just that that hardware, that same piece of hardware with very few changes shipped for almost five years. It got OS upgrades until the, the 1996. Over... 10 years of OS updates. Uh-huh. Over 10 years. One piece of hardware. And it wasn't even the fanciest piece of hardware when it shipped. When the Mac Plus came out, it was not the most powerful Mac. And it was quickly made even less power, like, powerful by comparison when the newer machine models came out over the years that followed. And yet, Apple made sure that the OS releases kept coming out for it, and they ran well on it. It was awesome. Over 10 years. Almost 11 years. How cool is that? How cool is that? I mean, come on. What hardware manufacturer does that nowadays? It's crazy. I, I, this boggles my mind. Uh, the hardware was modifiable. The hardware was upgradable. The hardware in many cases was user serviceable, though, though, <laughs> Apple recommended people not do it themselves and that they bring it into a Mac certified repair shop to do the repairs uh, if you want to keep your, your warranty intact. But still, it was user serviceable. And 10 plus years of operating system support on hardware. Oh, man. And then, and when you had the OS, when you had the OS, Apple shipped this amazing thing called HyperCard. It was a, it was, it was so many things to so many people. But what it essentially was, what it essentially boiled down to was a way to build your own software using a visual drag and drop components and a variety of simple English-like commands. In fact, the first version of Myst, one of the most famous adventure games of all time, was developed entirely in HyperCard on a Mac. It's true. It's true. The very first version of Myst, it was built in HyperCard. And it wasn't alone. There were so many great titles, games, uh, productivity applications, educational titles, encyclopedia type things, and more developed in HyperCard. It was a way to lower the barrier of entry, not just for people who were looking to create a game like Myst, but to lower the barrier of entry for average people to make their own software. Maybe they're not going to make the next great adventure game or office suite or whatever with it, but the fact that they can build their own things... Their own pieces of software was nothing short of amazing. Schools around the country and around the world had classes where the kids would create their own hypercard stacks, 
which is a hypercard stack is essentially like an application. It's just a different way of calling it. You build it in cards, stacks of cards, cards were in, in individual windows, essentially. And each one of them could be programmed and coded with buttons and everything else. And it lowered the barrier of entry for people wanting to get involved in development. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was that sort of attention to detail, that sort of acknowledgement that you want to make the computer accessible to as many people as possible, the power of it all, to be able to program for it. That was a beautiful thing. And it was a very, very Mac-like thing to do. And, and to, to take that even further, Apple created this thing called AppleScript. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. It was an English-like scripting language, very simple. Very simple English-like scripting language. But what made it really unique was not only could you sit there and type out a script, and it, which would essentially allow you to create your own application, but application developers, including those at Apple, creating the various components of Mac OS, were encouraged to create what was known as Apple Script dictionaries for their application. What was those dictionaries? It was essentially a hook into each application that said to the world, here is a list of everything you can do with my application via Apple Script. It could be anything from launch the application, open a new window. For Microsoft Word, for example, I, I was responsible for a lot of this functionality. You could go in and say, create a new, a new Word document, add this text to it, format it this way, move some text around, add some pictures, copy, paste, move, copy, save, export, everything. In fact, everything you could do with Visual Basic for application, you could do via Apple Script. And here's where it got cool. So many applications supported this, just about everything, to an almost pervasive and ridiculous degree that a thing called Script Editor, that little application you see right there on the screen, you could hit the record button on it and then just start using your Mac software. Everything you did would be recorded in a human-like scripting language as you clicked on buttons, as you open new windows, as you, as you save documents, as you renamed and moved and copied files, it would all be saved as that little script. And you hit stop, and you can look at your script. You can modify it if you want to, and then you could hit run. And what you essentially had was even though there was no command line that you were working with, it was entirely GUI based. You had scripting and automation that is significantly more powerful than any computer system ever made. That's not hyperbole. It was wild. Unix systems are beautiful. I'm a huge unix -y guy. Do one thing, do it well. Everything is a file. I love that mentality. And using that mentality, you can, in a shell on a Unix system, do remarkable feats of scripting and automation. And I'm telling you right now, the scripting and automation you could do on a classic Macintosh ran circles around some of the best Unix systems in the world. It was amazing. And it was all GUI based. And it, it was like friggin' magic. And then there's Apple Talk. <laughs> you, I, I know. Where's the, where's the sucks here, Lunduke? I know. These are all awesome things. Let's keep, let's keep going. We'll get to the suckiness in a minute. Here's Apple Talk. Apple Talk was a, a networking protocol, really a suite of networking protocols for the classic Macintosh. And what was great about it was how insanely easy it was to use. Set up a file server. Every file server on your network, every Mac on your network could now see it and work with it. It had permissions and the ability to copy, copy and move files around. You could share printers between each other. You could do it all, it all visually. It worked remarkably well. And it, this was all during a period of time when doing the same sort of functionality on, on even a, a well-networked Unix machine was a mild nightmare. <laughs> Apple Talk was amazing. It wasn't the most high-performance networking options available, as anyone would tell you but it was pretty gosh darn amazing. It was, it was kind of like magic. This is a 486 PC card. This is 
for putting a DOS PC, a whole DOS PC, with a CPU, a sound blaster, sound card, and everything right inside of a Macintosh. I, ha I have this one, in fact. In fact, I have this exact one. Uh, and it sits inside of a Power Macintosh 6100, which is a 66 megahertz power PC system. It has a 486DX2, which is a 66 megahertz 486 PC in it also. I hit a hotkey, and boom, a full screen toggle between Mac OS 8.1 running on my Macintosh PowerPC machine, or DOS and Windows 3.1 run running on my 486 at the same time on the same machine, able to share some of the same drive resources and memory resources and move files and copy and clipboards and everything between them. Apple focused on this. Now, there may be many reasons for that, and Apple may, be, may have been trying to, to, to stop people from leaving the Macintosh platform for the, the warm embrace of DOS and Windows and trying to keep them on the Mac. There may have been reasons for it. But the coolness here cannot be denied. There simply wasn't the same sort of thing. Uh, the PC makers were not, not making that same sort of thing available. With one exception, which we'll get to in a moment. This is Appearance Manager. The Macintosh was always about customizing your user experience. Making your machine look however you want. This was a default thing built into the OS. You can make your OS look ridiculous. I mean, look at some of these screenshots. Some of these are objectively hideous, but you could do it, right? I mean, this one, this one, this one right there, that one's pretty. <laughs> That's called papyrus. It's a nice, beautiful theme that you can get. There's tons of beautiful themes, but the thing is, there's also hideous ones. Hundreds, if not thousands of amazing and hideous themes all intermingled together and you could choose from them and change them to your heart's content. You can make your Mac look like whatever you wanted them to. You can make it look bizarre. It was out there. And part of that is just purely amazing. Machines don't do that nowadays. And that was beautiful. That you can make the machine your own. It was your own. It was a machine that really could could represent you if you want to use that green red bit of hideousness up there in the upper left hand corner god bless you you can if that's what your soul feels like you could make your mac represent that soul it's just hideous but you could do it it's awesome then there's extensions and control panels people don't realize how awesome this was you ever look at that, that default Mac boot up screen and along the bottom, all these little icons appear? Those little icons along the bottom are a combination of extensions and control panels. What are those? They're little drivers, essentially. They're terminate and stay resident programs that boot up and run and do just about anything. Sometimes they're hardware drivers. Sometimes they're, they're uh, uh, media frameworks. They're, they could be a wide variety of things. And here's what's great about them. Each one of them uses up RAM and resources and, and potentially other hardware resources. But what if one of them causes a problem? Well, you can just turn it off. There was a whole application called the Extensions Manager where you just go down and it's shown right there on the, the right-hand side of the screen and you just unselect each one. It shows you how big they are, <laughs> who, who shipped it, and what it's called. You just turn off all the ones you don't like and boop, reboot. And then you could go in and say, I want a custom set of extensions just for when I'm doing video work or just when I'm playing games or whatnot to fine-tune my, my system to be perfect for whatever task is at hand. And you can create saved sets that you could toggle between. Now you didn't have to use that extensions manager. Turns out the extensions and the control panels, that was just one folder on your system. That was literally just a folder on your system. You could just drag things in and out of it and reboot. <laughs> it was amazing. Imagine if you could do that. Can you do that on a Linux system? No, no. All the drivers on your Linux system, they're built into your kernel. <laughs> They're compiled in. You can't get rid of a single gosh darn one of them. Want to try removing drivers on your Windows system? Well, it's fine. It's probably going to break now. Your whole Windows system is broken. It's it's bro it's it's bricked. It's done. It's end. How about your your Mac OS X system or sorry your lowercase M Mac OS system? No, can't really do it there either. It's it's a pain in the butt. Uh, mo most of your drivers you just have to live with them. Uh, and if you don't like them, too bad. You can make the system your own. 
You were in control. You were trusted with your system. You were root. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Then there's this thing called res edit. And a lot of you are like, what the fart am I looking at, Lunduke? This is a resource editor. Well, what's a resource? Well, on a Macintosh, you ever look at a Mac application? You never notice that most Mac applications, they're just one file. It's just the executable application file. That's, that's what they've always been. And you all those applications have to have a bunch of resources, graphics and sounds and localized text strings and support databases and all these other things. On Windows, you, know, you install those as a whole bunch of applications, plus throw things in the UJ registry and, and throw a couple of things in the system folder. I mean, you, you install an application. Files are in 75,000 different places across your whole machine. It, it's absolutely insane. And Linux systems aren't much better in that regard. But on the classic Mac, everything from the icons to the artwork to the localized text to the sounds, everything was stored as resources in the resource fork of a file. So an application had all these resources in them that was essentially like a database. It was essentially a nice, big, structured database of all the possible things, the dialogues, the text on the dialogues, the text on the windows, everything that was in your application was in those resources which meant that as an end user, you could change them. You could change everything. I mean everything. You want to change the text that's on a dialog? You want to change the save dialog of an office suite? Okay, well, open it up and, and just find it in there. There's, there's text alerts, and if you look on the, on the, on the, even on that one example, there's the alerts, there's icons, there's dialogs, there's all sorts of things. Go in, to, go in and find it change the text for it, rerun the application, it now says whatever you told it to say. Instead of the save button, it's now the, I don't know, make fart noises button. Do whatever you want. Change the icons, change the graphics inside the games, change everything. Because it's your software. Someone else may have made it, but you get to make, it's on your system. Tweak it to your heart's content. Make it do whatever you want it to do. There's no, there's no check sum and signing, <laughs> right? You modify that software, and you go nuts. It's yours. And you should be able to do that. It's a, it's a wild and crazy idea. But it was beautiful. And it was powerful. And it was empowering. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Then there was the system folder. Now, why is that interesting? Why is it interesting to have a system folder on a Mac? You could literally take your system folder, which is right there. You see that little system folder? That's your entire operating system. Do you want to make a new hard drive bootable with your OS installed? Do you know how you do it? You drag that system folder to your new hard drive. Done. That's it. That's all you do. You can now boot off of that new drive, which means if you throw a system folder for any version of Mac OS onto a zip drive, a jazz drive, an external hard drive, anything, it'll boot off of it. If your Mac can read it and recognize it as a drive that's formatted with the Mac file system, HFS Plus, you can boot off of that. It's beautiful. That's it. It's amazing. Want to make a, a recovery drive? Sure. Just copy your system folder to it. In the old days, you just throw your system folder on a floppy. Boom. You now have a new system folder. Take out the things you don't want. Modify it as you like. It's easy. Everything's human readable. All the files in it. It's not that complicated. And you only have to bring along whatever applications you want. Don't Usually a Mac had an applications folder. There was no rhyme or reason to it. It was chaos. You could throw whatever applications you want in there. Your applications don't even have to be in there. You don't even have to have an applications folder. You can get rid of it entirely. You can put all your applications on the desktop if you want to. You can put it wherever you want. It doesn't matter. It was beautiful. That was gold glorious. Whoa, I'm bumping things. The Mac was so weird that it was amazing. No systems are like this nowadays. None. And Apple had, throughout this period of time, and well into the Mac OS X time period, this, this core feeling that you should do whatever the heck you want with your computer and everything that touches it. This was exemplified by the Rip Mix Burn ad campaign. It was a simple idea. They were trying to sell an iMac with a CD burner, right? Well, 
What are people going to do with a CD burner? They're going to burn CDs. How about burning audio CDs? Okay. So Apple was like, well, let's have people stick their music CDs in and we'll use our software to rip MP3s of those music CDs. And then they can make their own custom playlists and burn them back to new CDs. Rip, mix, burn, go nuts. No DRM involved, just go nuts. That was the style. That was the approach everywhere. If there was something on your computer that touched your computer, it was yours. You should modify it. You should go nuts with it. It was awesome. It was awesome. And Apple even tried to work with other operating systems, other OS vendors, and even ported operating systems to the Mac and made the Mac ported to other operating systems. This is a screenshot of Mac OS running on Unix, on HPUX and Solaris. It runs. Totally real thing. Real thing that shipped, was available for, for years. Uh, Apple thought it was great. <laughs> it's not a joke. It was awesome. It was awesome. Apple, Apple was all about this. It was for a, for a period of time, they were all about this. And now think, think on this for a minute. What made the Mac great? What are the things that made the Mac great? It was easy, easy, to, easy upgradability super easy upgrade ability with, with a certain level of self-repair. I mean, you could not repair certain things, but I mean, there was daughter cards and CPU upgrades that you could do and video card upgrades and, and hot swappable this and that and hot swappable batteries and drives and SCSI. You could, you could really go nuts with self-repair and, and highly high levels of upgradability on a Mac, both the desktops and the laptops. There was no level of internet dependency, though some of that was because of the time period, but there was no level of internet dependency. There was no activation. There was no activation happening. You have a machine, the software on it is yours, you do with it what you want. There was extreme levels of unrivaled scriptability, the likes of which we have not seen since. There was huge, Huge amounts of customization. You want to make your Mac look ugly as a dog painted purple? You can. You can. That's, that's, your, that's your wish. Make it happen. There was a hugely long hardware lifespan it, with OS support for close to 11 years in most cases and extremely, extremely low barrier to entry for software development. These are some of the things that made the Mac great. Not the human interface guidelines, though those were nice. Many people harp on that as being the thing about the Mac that was great. Not pushing the barriers of the technological limits here and there. Nope. It was this stuff. It was this stuff right here. This is the stuff. That's what made the Mac great. That's what made the people who loved the Macintoshes really love it. The Macintosh was unique. It was weird. It was flawed, but it was awesome. And here's just a few times... <laughs> the, just a few times that the Mac was almost even more awesome than that. This is Copeland. This almost shipped. <laughs> this, this was before Mac OS 8 came out. There was an attempt to make a brand new, wholly overhauled Mac OS that was much more powerful. It was built on top of a microkernel, lots of preemptive multitasking, lots of really, really cool features. There was lots of projects related to this. It was a disaster, but it was actually a really cool system. I, I worked on, uh, I worked for some software houses that were using uh, early, like pre-release dev releases of Copeland for for quite some time. And I actually used Copeland uh, in, in the development of software and it was actually fairly far along, but they, they ended up scrapping it, but it would have been awesome. Also, did you know that Apple actually tried to make their own CPU back in the 80s? Yeah, it was called the Aquarius Project. It was, it was the Scorpius CPU. And initially it was this really bizarre CPU type that was gonna be very heavily relied on a very specific structure to the software to use. And ultimately, the software team at Apple, like the Mac developers, were just like, no, look, this is just, this is just making our head hurts. We can't, we can't do this. So they turned it into a RISC CPU. So yeah, Apple was working on a RISC CPU in the 80s and never shipped. <laughs> Project Aquarius never shipped. You can find the document for this. If you go in like on archive.org or something like that and look up the Aquarius project from 1989, you can read like a couple hundred pages of the design documents for this risk CPU that Apple was making. They they got they got it going. They just never shipped it. Then there was the Mac clones. 
There was a couple of dozen hardware companies that shipped Mac clones in the 1990s, and some of them were pretty doggone awesome. A little bit cheaper sometimes, a little more expensive sometimes than the Apple hardware, but you could get machines that were more um, PC-like in appearance, you know? You could have like custom big old towers with lots of drive bays, and a lot of media professionals would grab these bad boys fully supported, running a full version of Mac OS, great, great machines, and they, we had clones. And there were so many pieces of hardware that almost shipped like this, the Book Mac. No, not the MacBook. This was the Book Mac from, from the 80s, the very early 80s, imagining what a Mac laptop could be like. And a Mac Slate. Look at that. Look at the one on the left. That's a Slate. It's like they took an Apple IIc and ran over it like with a steamroller. I want one. I don't know what's going on there, but I want all of those things. And then there's Yellow Box. In more recent times, Mac, Apple, acquired Next. And that's how Steve Jobs came back to the company. Because Steve Jobs, after he got booted from Apple, a ways after that, he started Next. And they built Next Step. And eventually they built Open Step, which was Next Step tweaked a bit and running on more platforms. And then when Apple acquired Next and Steve became the CEO of Apple again, roundaboutly, one of the things they created was called Yellow Box. So Mac, the idea was simple. Here's Mac OS, right? Mac OS would use all of those things that they got from Next. They called them the Cocoa Frameworks, the Next Step Frameworks. Well, in order to make software easy to port between platforms, they made it so they ported all of those frameworks, the whole kit and caboodle, to Windows. They called it Yellowbox. Yellow Box was, this was part of Yellowbox. There was gonna be more platforms involved as well. But you could run all those Mac applications, the same ones, same code, no code changes on Windows. It shipped, it existed. Uh, we don't really have it anymore because Apple eventually dropped it. But the reality was for a period of time, if you developed Coco applications for the earliest versions of Mac OS X, you could get them running with a few exceptions, entirely on Windows, fully supported by Apple. It was pretty rad. And then here's Jonathan. This is the last one I'm going to show you. Jonathan was an idea that Apple had for a completely modular, they called it a book-like Mac, where you have a bookshelf and each individual component, drive bays, CPU bays, hard drives, all the sorts of things. You could just slide them in, connect them using a, cu a custom connection peripheral interface, and you could continually upgrade your Macintosh, right? Right, So you could keep all your drives, your peripherals, your optical drives, everything, but man, you really need a new CPU. Okay, pull that book out, slide a new book in. Beautiful, isn't it? The Jonathan, I want that so bad. And th there's so many more. There's so many projects that Apple went through. Again, a lot of this is about being weird. Apple was weird and unique. Project Pink, Powerbop, Penlight. The Pippin, Gershwin, Star Trek, OpenDoc, BIOS was almost the replacement for Mac OS. And look up Star Trek, by the way. Project Star Trek was an effort to get Mac OS ported to the x86 platform. It got pretty far along. It's actually pretty amazing. And Pippin and Interactive TV was Apple's set-top gaming platform and interactive TV box. Amazing. Amazing. So many weird, bizarre things. And that encapsulates... Some of what made the Mac great is how weird it was. Which brings us to the present day Mac. Let's look at Mac today, driven by Apple in 2023. Let's think about all those things we just thought about, all those amazing features, all those things that made the Mac awesome. They're all gone. All those things. Apple killed every single one of them. Don't believe me? Go back, go back. Once we're done with this show, go back through the video. Look at every single feature I point out. Apple killed them all. And when I say killed them all, I don't just mean that that feature got replaced by another. I mean the ideas themselves. Dead. Apple saw what made the Mac great and they killed it on purpose because they had those functionalities they had those apps they had those those features 
They were working for years. People loved them. People depended on them. People adored them. People criticized them. And perhaps that's why they changed it. Perhaps they got bullied into giving up the things that made them unique. All of these things made the Mac great. All of them. When did that go away? When did all of them get killed? It's hard to pin down an exact moment, but I think I've come close. January 8th, 2007. When Apple dropped the word computer from their company name. That's right, until... From the very beginning, from 1976 until 2007, the company name was Apple Computer Incorporated. But Steve didn't like that. He felt like we needed to drop, they needed to drop the word computer from the name of the company. This is his quote. The Mac, iPod, Apple TV, and iPhone. Only one of those things is a computer, he said. So we're changing the name. Now, you may sit back and say, but actually all of those things are computers. Steve didn't view them that way. He wanted to fundamentally change. He didn't feel like he was wanting to run a computer company anymore. And so all of those things that made the Macintosh a truly unique and impressive computer, a computer with flaws <laughs> that were worth making fun of, but amazing. He didn't want to do those anymore. He wanted to do something different with less computer in the name. And that shift away from computers had an immediate and profound impact on their computers. Who would have thought that? It'd be like, um, I don't know, if, if uh, Coca-Cola changed their name to um, uh, uh, Cars and Trucks. They're now Cars and Trucks Corporation. Well, um, I wonder how that's going to impact their, their soda line. <laughs> Like, is that going to have an impact on Coke? <laughs> Probably. If they changed their name completely, that's what Apple did. They dropped the word in their name that said what they did. They're no longer, as of 2007, a computer company. And that was on purpose. Now, throughout this period of time, when Steve came back, it brought Next Step and Open Step with them. This is, this is what Next Step looked like. And Next Step is all by itself an amazing system, right? It's an amazing and interesting system that is not a Mac. <laughs> that is a key thing here. It is a fascinating, amazing, Unixy, beautiful, heavily object-oriented system that I am a big fan of. It is not a Mac. There is almost nothing about this, this system right here, that is Mac-like. Almost nothing. Nothing at all. I was a Mac developer for years. And then when I first got my hands on the very first version of Mac OS, which was known as Mac OS X Server 1.0, it was essentially this with a Mac-like UI. And as I was sitting there porting software that we were working on over to this new system, I was struck by two things. The first was that I like this system. It's cool. It has problems just like any. It was kind of slow and sluggish, but it was a pretty cool system. And two, it had nothing in common with a Mac. It didn't work like a Mac. It didn't look like a Mac. didn't act like a Mac. Programming it wasn't like using a, programming for a Mac. And there was just nothing Mac-like about it. And all the cool things that I had come to rely on, to use at, in working in Mac software, it, they were gone. Not just specific applications, but concepts. Gone. Gone. And as that, as those years cranked along, all of a sudden you couldn't, you couldn't change batteries anymore. You couldn't, you couldn't even add RAM to your hardware anymore. There is currently just like no upgradability. Get a Mac laptop. That's what it is. What you bought is what you get. You can't fix it. You can't upgrade it. You can't swap out a battery at all. Not even with some real fancy screws. Those machines are glued in place. It's ridiculous. It's a wholly different way of approaching hardware than Apple ever had before. Now, some people may look at that and say, yes, but the hardware is so impressive. That may be true. And you know what? It is. Look how thin that is. <laughs> look how amazing the battery life is. <clears throat> the performance is spectacular. But it is not in any way, shape, or form Mac-like. 
the only things that have anything even remotely Mac-like about it is that there's a little Apple logo and there's a command key on the keyboard. Other than that, the usage of that command key, by the way, has changed. It's not the same as it used to be. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. I just snorted. Um, but otherwise, it's not a Mac at all. Now, let, let's look at that upgradability thing. This is, this is a screenshot of Mac OS 10.15. It can run, at best, on machines built six years before it. Remember how we talked about the uh, that version of Mac OS 7.5.5 that could run on almost 11-year-old hardware, fully supported? Yeah. We're now down to six. We're almost in half over what it used to be. And now a lot of you might be thinking, yeah, but that's still plenty. That's really good. And in fact, in fact, this is the best you can get currently because depending on the line you're at, you're looking at more like five years. It's getting a little bit, a little bit lower. This is the trend over time. Don't believe me? Look it up. When Mac OS 11 shipped, when it shipped, it could run on hardware up to eight years old. Some of the lines. Not all of them, but some of them. That was pretty good. Not 11. <laughs> it's not as good as it was. It's three years less than it used to be, but okay. When it what was 10.13 shipped, it was seven years. When 10.15 shipped, it's... It's six years, and it's decreasing. Don't believe me? Look it up. It's decreasing fast, and that is sucky as heck. Uh, this, this is a screenshot of the Mac App Store. Increasingly, Apple is not shipping software. You can't buy software outside of it in a lot of cases, and they're forcing people to use the Mac App Store for even the most rudimentary of tasks. They're tying people into Mac online services in order to get the core functionality of their OS working in many cases. It is almost impossible to use a Mac and not use the internet. That sucks. That is the least Mac-like thing I can think of. That sucks. Now, many of you are like, ah, oh, but the internet, it's here to stay. It's fresh. No, that is not Mac-like. It sucks. If, if your system is the most unlike your own system, if your own system sucks at being your system, that's really sucky. This right here, this is what Mac OS looks like. This is a screenshot of Mac OS 10.15. That is what it looks like. That's just what it looks like. Want to change it? No, that's what it looks like. Remember when I showed you that, that cool thing with the appearance manager and the old Mac OS where you can make it look absolutely psycho and hideous or beautiful and amazing? Make it look like whatever you want? No, you can't do that. Instead, Apple has shipped the, this replacement for Apple's appearance manager. It's nothing. The thing they had that was so cool about it, there's no replacement. It's not possible. That functionality can't be done anymore. Not from Apple. They don't want you to. Same with HyperCard. Here's the HyperCard replacement. Pretty neat, huh? Doesn't exist. Apple Talk. There's no real Apple Talk replacement. They sort of tried with something called Rendezvous and CeroConf. Didn't really work. And didn't provide what made Apple Talk great. Now, technically, technically, Apple Script kind of, sort of still exists. A little bit. Barely, but there, it is so fundamentally unsupported that the vast majority of the Mac OS itself does not have Mac Apple script dictionaries and where it does, half of them are broken <laughs> and unsupported. And most of the software that ships doesn't even have an Apple script dictionary. You know what? Ask most of the current Mac and iOS developers about their Apple script dictionaries, and they will look at you with a blank stare because they have never used a Mac before. Not joking. Not joking. It really, really sucks. So here we are today in 2023, and this is the Mac strategy of suckiness as I see it, TM. <laughs> there is no upgradability. There is no self-repair. None. None. It's glued. You can't do nothing. There's no removable batteries. Forget hot swappable multiple batteries and awesomeness of the 90s. No. You get nothing and you'll be happy. Forced internet dependency. Forced. You will use the internet. You will pay for our online services or your system will essentially be hobbled. There is extraordinarily limited scriptability. 
The Mac went from the most scriptable platform on planet Earth to an absolute joke of scriptability and automation. Like it's limited to a ridiculous degree. The amount of customization you can do on a Mac is so astoundingly limited that Windows laughs at the Mac. That's not a good place to be. It has a a short hardware lifespan that is getting shorter every release. Think about that for a minute. And the barrier to entry for development is extraordinarily high. Whereas dev tools used to be readily available, extraordinarily powerful, and easy to learn for many users. You now have dev tools that are harder to learn than they used to be. And the amount of money you have to spend in order to ship software is ridiculous. Yes, you have to spend money to ship Apple software now. Want to make Mac software? Want to make iOS software? You have to pay Apple for the privilege of coding some software. It's slow. It's buggy. It's harder to learn than ever. And you have to pay for it. Want to be an average user that just wants to putz around and and make a quick little recipe card application or, or a little adventure game? Too bad. So sad. No hyper card for you. The reality is this. Apple made something absolutely amazing for over 15 years. Amazing. Weird. Make funnable. Make funnable. Quirky as heck, but amazing. And then, for whatever reason, they decided to make something that is truly unmac like Now, many people like this thing that's not Mac-like, and that's fine. You can love the current Mac OS and the way it integrates with things and how it works and the fact that you can't upgrade anything. You can love that. Many people do. Just look at their bottom line. Apple's making a boatload of money. And many people will say, ha ha, Lunduke, you're wrong. Apple's making so much money. That doesn't mean that Apple's Mac OS doesn't suck at being a Mac. It's about the least Mac-like system in existence. Windows, Linux, Haiku, even some of the Amiga clones are more like an old Mac than the current Mac. And I mean that, I mean that in the most derogatory way I can possibly say it towards Apple right now. And the future looks so grim. Oh my Lord. What's the future look like? It looks like not a Mac. The future of a Mac is not a Mac. The future of a Mac is a dystopian thing where your eyeballs are custom generated deep fakes. You strap a thing to your face and you use a thing that's not at all a Mac, doesn't look like a Mac, doesn't act like a Mac, doesn't have any of the features that made a Mac great. Not one. Not one of the features that made the Macintosh great is in existence on what is the future of the Mac. In fact, this. Wait, wait, hold on. (laughs) Where, where am I at here? There we go. So the, the what, what's going to happen is this is going to ship this next year. The, the Apple Vision Pro goggles. And Apple Computer will, as usual, help drive the industry in a particular direction. When Apple does things, the industry pays attention. They always have. Microsoft paid attention to Apple in the 80s closely. So did digital research and many others. Same with the 90s. Same with the 2000s. Oh my gosh, did they set trend after trend after trend for years. Steve Jobs famously ridiculed Bill Gates for simply not having vision. Because back then, Steve had vision. The other engineers and and product people at Apple had vision. Just look at the list of failed projects. The failed projects at Apple are some of the most amazing projects ever. And those are the ones that failed. It was an amazing time. And when Apple gives up on all the things that made the Macintosh a great computer, an interesting computer, a computer that even if you don't want to use, and even if I didn't want to use, it deserved to exist purely because of its uniqueness. Apple will drive the whole industry towards that level of suckiness. This is the last true Mac OS. This is macOS 9.2. It's a good system. It's a good system. 
Apple held, Steve Jobs held a, a, a ceremony, a funeral for this system. I was in attendance that day. They, have, they brought a coffin out on stage and organ music started playing and a fog machine cast spooky, spooky fog over the audience. And he propped up a giant oversized Mac OS 9 box. And Steve Jobs eulogized Mac OS 9. And people in the audience, and I'll be very clear about this. This was at Worldwide Developer Conference many years back. People in the audience sat there recognizing that there was some true beauty and some true improvements coming with Mac OS X that we got from the next step stuff. But all of us longtime Mac developers, hundreds of us, sat there. This was in San Jose, I believe, back before it moved to San Francisco. And we sat there and watched Steve eulogize Mac OS 9. And there was tears. <laughs> Not because we were happy. Because we were sad. We lost something that day. We lost something beautiful. Something with more features than, that we knew we would probably never see again. Because Microsoft wasn't doing them. They weren't available over on Linux. And Apple seemed to not be interested in, in bringing them over. For a period of a few years, Apple paid lip service to some of those features. Like AppleScript. They created a thing called AppleScript Builder for a short period of time. Where they were going to be able to use AppleScript to make full native macOS applications and the like. Like every other bit of the lip service towards the people who loved the classic Mac OS, it was short-lived. And the Mac quickly went away. And these were the people. These were the misfits, the crazy ones, the rebels, the round pegs and the square holes. Some of them that made that possible. The, uh, the, the top left with a few, few exceptions, I think uh, Raskin's not in that picture. That's the original Macintosh team. It was an amazing thing. It truly was. But it wasn't just that original team of misfits and rebels that made it great. It was the fact that that, that company and those people had misfits and rebels doing weird misfitty rebelly things for years to come. But not anymore. Your Mac will now look like everyone else's Mac. Your Mac will never be changed. You cannot upgrade your Mac. You cannot modify your Mac. You cannot even change the battery in your Mac. You do cannot easily program your Mac. And if you try to program your Mac, you better be willing to pay a hundred and whatever dollars it is for the developer connection. You will not automate and script your Mac. You will not do any of these things. In short, the future of the Mac is not great. The future of the Mac is sad. But the future of the spirit of the Mac could live on, just not with Apple. It is my hope, my humble, humble hope, that someone out there takes a firm look at what was happening with the Macintosh through the 80s, through the 90s, and even the early 2000s, and thinks to themselves, gee, that was kind of awesome. Maybe if we did that, but fixed some of the problems, like the multitasking issues, which it did have, because it was cooperative instead of preemptive, maybe we could have something great. Which was the whole point of the Copeland project, it just it never shipped. So there we have it. We come to the end of this little show, which I'm thinking is going to have been a lot different than a lot of people were expecting. I think a lot of people would be expecting to sit down to a full hour of Mac jokes and Mac bashing, when the reality is we spent most of the time talking about what made the Mac great. Because I think there is no better example as to why the current Mac absolutely sucks rocks than to look at what the Mac was and how it isn't that thing anymore. Thank you. <laughs> and good night. Hey.